Growing up, this was the soundtrack to one of my favorite games, Resident Evil. But out of context, well, it was sort of a massive joke on the internet. And I had the same reaction probably a lot of people had, where it was just like, I can't, is this actually in the game? Is this real? In this case, the emotional reaction is just like, what? <laughs> is this real? Is this a hoax? Oh, but it was real. And just as unbelievable as the song is the story behind its composer, Mamoru Samurogochi. The deaf composer who was acclaimed as Japan's Beethoven for the digital age. However, he wasn't deaf at all. And someone else was writing his music. He's the video game composer that fooled the world. Almost. Now, before we get into the scandal, I wanted to get a broader perspective on what some of my GameSpot friends thought of this song before they knew the truth behind it. What's up, mate? Stop what you're doing, and I need you to listen to the song right now. There's something about this song that I really like. Uh, it reminds me of uh, crawling out of bed, not looking forward to the day. A cacophony of what is supposed to be a military song from a SNES game jumble. Is that what's happening? It's like a kid pressing all the buttons at once. It's like when your cat walks along your keyboard. Right, it sounds like a cat walking on a keyboard. So how would you feel if I told you that was composed by a deaf guy? I wouldn't be surprised. I shouldn't laugh at that, that's awful, but yeah, that makes sense, doesn't it? Curveball, he wasn't actually deaf, he faked it. What? Wait, but the guy who did write it, could he hear? During the 2014 Sochi Olympics, acclaimed Japanese figure skater Daisuke Takashi was supposed to perform to Sonatina for Violin, a piece by Samurogochi. And then a press conference interrupted Japanese daytime television featuring this man. He claimed that Mamoru Samurogochi, the composer of video game soundtracks and the Hiroshima Symphony, did not write any of his own music. He was Takashi Nigaki a composer, arranger, and professor at the Tokyo College, the man behind all of Samurogochi's music. Oh, and Samurogochi's deafness? That was all fake. He could hear just fine. Takashi had been ghost composing for Mamoru for 18 years, and it started with the Resident Evil Director's Cut DualShock version soundtrack, which was different from the original 1996 soundtrack. So, why the different soundtrack? Well, Capcom was re-releasing Resident Evil 1 in 1998 for the cusp of its sequel's release. And to give the two-year-old game some sort of facelift, they commissioned the up-and-coming deaf composer, Mamoru Samaragochi, to give the game an orchestral soundtrack which differed from its 1996 release. So, that faked hearing loss was all part of a publicity stunt that served him success for many, many years. Being quoted by Time Asia for things like, The saddest thing for me is not to be able to hear an orchestra perform my work. But his biggest claim to fame was his Symphony No. 1, Hiroshima, which kind of became a cathartic anthem in response to the 1945 bombing, and it was that that propelled him into stardom. Japan's Beethoven for the digital age, until the 2014 Sochi Olympics. Now there's a lot to unpack with this revelation, but if there's one glaring thing I could not stop thinking about is that this sonically insulting piece of music was composed by someone who actually knew what he was doing. And that made me wonder, is there something we're missing? What if the Mansion Basement song actually isn't that bad? 
I studied classical guitar. You know, I, I was really fascinated by music theory, especially in some of the later courses where you start talking about kind of um, serialism and polytonality. Polytonality just means it's a song with two keys going on at the same time, which sounds horrendous. I, I never liked it. Like, it sounds like two very clashing ideas at the same time, which is a... It is a mood, you know, that is a context. If that's what you're going for, there you go. I just started kind of seeing patterns and stuff in music that I didn't see patterns before. I, I, I sat down with it and I transcribed it note for note. I had one day where I was like, all I'm gonna do today is try to figure out what's going on in this song. And I sat there and every second just said like, okay, what notes am I hearing here? So then once I was done with that, I uh, decided, okay, now if I make a chord line to this, how can I make these notes makes sense, like almost sound that like they were intentional. I know deeply all the contours and <laughs> everything. It's interesting because there there is a very um, distinct call and response going on where you have this musical idea and then it's repeated. You know, you have this da 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 and then you have it happen again very shortly afterwards. Th there's, there's some kind of planning here. It's interesting because there is a, a specific compositional technique that's being used that has been used actually by a lot of contemporary classical musicians to evoke true feelings of dread, and that is whenever you take the interval of a half step, just two notes very, very close together, and you start stacking that on top of one another. So you have a bunch of different musicians and a bunch of different, like, in this case, synthesizers playing very, very close together. And sometimes that actually can be done to a very, very good effect, like a very dread-inducing effect. There's a piece by the Hungarian composer Georgi Ligeti named Lux Eterna. And it's from the soundtrack of 2001 A Space Odyssey. And it actually uses the exact same technique where you have these half step intervals very close together. I mean, immediately, it is beautiful and eerie. Yeah, it's bizarre. It's like there's two songs happening at the same time, one of which conveys on ease when the other one is kind of peaceful. I would actually listen to this in my free time, I think. There is like, there is this underlying structure to it that is coming from a fairly serious place. It's just, it wasn't realized that way at all. It's a very goofy sounding piece of music, but there are plenty of other goofy sounding pieces of music and we don't react to them maybe in the same way. Music is very context dependent. Music can be used for many different things. Um, be used to score video games, to be used to score film. We can listen to it and dance to it. You have to understand what the intent of a piece of music is. So sometimes you have very strange, aggressive pieces of music, which in certain contexts would be weird, but in other contexts would be perfect. And in this case, you know, I can't really think of the best context for this. It clearly was supposed to create a sense of dread and it failed miserably. There is a lot of subjectivity in art, but there is also a degree of objectivity. What is the art trying to do? And in this case, it's a bad piece of art because it didn't do what it was trying to do, in my opinion anyway. Now the thing that I find so fascinating about the song is that it seems to have taken on a life all its own, completely separate from the scandal itself, inspiring people like Jules to do a metal rendition and who only vaguely knew about the composer behind it. And furthermore, the, the song kind of became a joke with its own identity, thus spawning a ton of memes. There's always a lot of memes. The scandal part of it wasn't as big um, a discussion topic as the song itself. The internet likes to burn 
fuel in its memes and that kind of stuff. So people took it, it was the talk for a bit and then disposed of it. It's been more interesting as a meme once people forgot about it almost, because when it first came out, we didn't have things like meme templates, meme formats, the four picture format, whatever it may be. We were just putting things out and going, haha, this is weird, retweet or like or whatever it may be, say something about it. And I think all this is to say is that this song's legacy isn't in the wild story of its composer, but rather us the community, the people who heard this and shared it in disbelief. So what happened to Takashi and Mamoru in the end? Well, after the scandal, Takashi was given full recognition for all of his work and was even commissioned to do a follow-up to his first symphony, Hiroshima, entitled Symphony No. 2, Litany. As for Samurai Gochi, well, it's safe to say that he faded into obscurity, unlike the song people think he made. Now, it's worth noting that the entirety of the Resident Evil 1 Director's Cut DualShock version isn't all that bad. It's just, well, it's certainly memorable. Whether or not that's for the right reasons, I don't know. So while it's easy to hear that soundtrack and assume that the person who made it had no idea what they were doing, know that they did and that they're actually a talented composer and that there is theory and intent behind specifically the mansion basement. It's not nonsense. It just may not be your jam or most of our jams for that matter. And unfortunately, we will never discover why this happened or who approved it. Those are pieces of a puzzle that are locked behind a door we may never find a key to. What I can say is that this song is probably the perfect rendition to this whole story. Fragmented, confusingly layered, and well, weirdly compelling. <laughs> No, this is still awful. This is still bad. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of Remember When, the working at home with my cats edition. Oh God. If you dug this, you should check out some of our other ongoing shows like Loadout and Audio Logs. There's also True Fiction, which I also host on GameSpot Universe. Please like, comment, and subscribe if you're not already. It would mean a lot to me personally. Okay, bye.